A chicken is a bird. And birds are dinosaurs. And while a Velociraptor is a dinosaur, and had feathers, it's not a bird. And it didn't eat chickens. Because chickens didn't exist 65 million years ago. Today, only avian dinosaurs are still alive. Dinosaurs that are bipedal, feathered, winged, and had beaks. We call them birds, or aves in Latin. So when did some dinosaurs also become birds, and others, like this brachiosaur, just dinosaurs? And why are some animals, like hens, hummingbirds, or even humans, that weren't around millions of years ago, present today? New species appear by evolving from existing species, which themselves can die off, like the dinosaurs, 65 million years ago. And while 65 million years sounds like an enormous amount of time, dinosaurs were on the planet for 166 million years a fraction of the amount of time insects have been around, less still than land plants, or fish, but all pale compared with bacteria, which have been found fossilized for 3.4 billion years. Far longer than any multicellular organism, bacteria has been evolving and living on the planet since nearly its formation 4.5 billion years ago. To put this into context, if all of life on Earth was converted into 24 hours, with midnight being the formation of Earth, we, Homo sapiens, would be the last minute and 17 seconds. Land plants would be 2 hours, and bacteria would be a little over 18 hours of the day. What this shows is that life has been evolving and adapting to the planet for a long time. What's incredible is that 99% of the organisms that have lived on the planet have gone extinct. That may be hard to imagine, since the world is full of animals and plants today. But these organisms arose as the result of billions of years of evolution. So how is it new species keep appearing? Well, here's an example. We know that all members of the soapberry plant family, Sapindaceae, had a single common ancestor. Millions of years ago, the ancestral population of all soapberry plants became the food source for a population of insects. This insect population became soapberry seed specialists, feeding exclusively on the seeds. The descendants of this population of insects would become our modern day soapberry bugs. Wherever the soapberry plant grew, their seed predators followed, and both extended across early Earth. Around the mid Cretaceous, the separation of the continents isolated populations of soapberry plants and their bugs. These populations then evolved independently into new species over millions of years. Today, 2,000 species of soapberry plants are known across the planet, and a subset of these are food for 65 species of soapberry bugs. No two species of soapberry bugs are alike because their lineages have faced different challenges from their native soapberry plants. If you were a soapberry bug whose ancestors evolved on balloon vine, you'd be endowed with large beak. The seeds the bugs feed on are inside a protected balloon. Those with smaller beaks would have to wait for the balloons to drop their fruit. If you had a long beak, you could reach inside the fruit to the seeds before they drop. This gives an advantage to bugs with long beaks. Since they have more access to food, they can produce more offspring. Over time, this trait would become well represented among balloon bugs, as the number of long beak bugs outcompete the insects with short beaks. Strong flight muscles would also be advantageous. Well developed muscles could carry you to your favorite food source, as well as help find a mate. If you were a bug whose ancestors evolved on the golden rain tree, you would face different challenges. The fruit pods of the golden rain tree are thin. So there's no advantage to evolve long beaks, and subsequently, long beaks are not found on the native golden rain tree feeding bugs. Unlike the balloon vine, which produces seeds year-round, golden rain tree drop all their seeds in one annual burst. During this time, the population of insects greatly increases to take full advantage of the abundant seeds. This drives the evolution of insects that mature quickly and produce many eggs. So here we have two soberry bugs, Jadera hematiloma, which feed on the balloon vine, and Leptochorus vicinus, a golden rain tree specialist found in Taiwan. Millions of years ago, they shared a common ancestor, but a wide range of forces has driven them down separate evolutionary paths. This is speciation over a long time frame. If we wanted to look deeper into how speciation occurs, we need to catch in the act, like near the time adaptive diversification begins. Today, the globalization and homogenization of exotic plants in city areas has created such an opportunity. In the early 20th century, the balloon vine, Cardiospermum corindum, could be found throughout much of southern Florida. The Taiwanese golden rain tree was first widely planted in the 1950s. It was planted in urban areas as an ornamental tree. 
In the second half of the century, the plant's distribution spread throughout much of Florida. During this time, the range of cardiospermum was reduced to the southern tip of Florida. As the range of the balloon vine retreated, the golden rain trees grew. This provided the opportunity for Jadari hematiloma to switch from its native host to the introduced host. We call this transition between hosts a horizontal host transfer. Today, populations of Jadari hematiloma exist on separate hosts in southern and central Florida. We know these groups of insects shared a recent common ancestral population that fed on balloon vine, cardiospermum, and diverged in the last 60 years. When the different populations were collected and measured, scientists found two different host types had started to develop. You could think of them as separate ecotypes, or breeds of insects. One type fed on cardiospermum. They had the longer beaks necessary to get to the fruit, as well as longer and wider bodies. The other type fed on golden rain tree, and were slightly smaller. This suggested that the introduced type had adapted to the pressures exerted by the invading golden rain tree, and provided a platform to detect whether the apparent adaptations to the new host were genetic, that has evolved, or were instead non-genetic effects of growing up on seeds of a different plant species. So, a reciprocal rearing experiment was designed to measure and test whether there was an adaptive divergence in the two populations. In effect, were the insects beginning to evolve the differences that could lead them to become separate species? To test this, the two types were collected and caged from the five test sites, three from central Florida, feeding on the golden rain tree, and two populations in the south, feeding on balloon vine. Each cage then had a mating pair selected to collect eggs from. This was repeated multiple times for each cage. Eggs would be collected with an aspirator and left to hatch in a vial. Each baby nymph was given either its ancestral host seed or the seed of the opposite type. The nymphs were left to develop with their little seeds. By having the nymphs of each type feed on the different seeds, we can see if the seed's type has an effect on growth and development time. In the soapberry bug life cycle, nymphs molt five times to reach adulthood, the stage where they have wings and mature sexual organs. The length of time it took to reach maturity was recorded for each individual, as was the body width and beak length. The insects from the petri dish were then given a mate that was raised under similar conditions. The eggs and survivorship of the young were measured for each couple. When the measurements were compared, scientists found that the ancestral type bugs feeding on the native seeds developed to maturity much more quickly than on the introduced seeds. And the introduced type bugs developed to maturity much more quickly on the introduced seeds than on the native seeds. You can think of development time as running a race. The quicker the bugs finish, the quicker they can reproduce and multiply their numbers. We can see that for nymphs, feeding on their home host is more favorable than feeding on their alternative host. This is likely due to the differences in the defensive chemistry and nutritional quality between the seeds, which may pose a challenge to the unadapted developing nymphs. This chart suggests that the golden rain tree type has evolved to overcome the golden rain tree's defenses, while simultaneously losing its ability to develop on the balloon vine. Measurements taken for thorax width, which is the measurement of the overall size of the bug, indicate nymphs that fed on the alien food source were small as adults. So not only does it take longer to reach maturity on your alien host, but the mature size is still smaller than if you were an insect feeding on your preferential food. Since your overall size also contributes to your beak size, it's not surprising that beak lengths are also reduced if feeding on the alien food source. This shows, more than any other factor, beak length was derived from the home population and not from the rearing host, meaning evolution of the genes for expressing short beak lengths in the introduced type bugs has taken place. So we can see there is a divergence in how the different food sources affect the insect's development and size. The descendants of the insects in northern Florida that have switched hosts from balloon vine to golden rain tree have adapted to their new host in a way that there are costs associated with switching back to the native hosts. This is good evidence for diversification. Okay, it's one thing to see the evolution of a beak that matches your food, similar to what Darwin observed happening in his finches but it's another to look inside an insect's internal abilities to exploit the different seeds. You see, the two seeds have different seed chemistries and require a different package of adaptations to do well. If you look at the native and derived type bugs feeding on their home host, the percentage of offspring that survive is quite high. Now, if we rear the native type on the introduced seed, oh, well, babies don't do well, only half survive. 
Since this experiment simulates the native host bug's first encounter with the introduced golden rain tree, it's like going back in time to observe what the first generation of soapberry bugs that host switch were like. The date, 1958. Location, Central Florida. The bugs are drawn in by smell to a near limitless food source. There are fewer balloon vine as the balloon vine range was receding to southernmost Florida. But 50 years later, the descendants of these bugs are doing fine and have evolved to cope with the new seeds. Indeed, they are so well adapted to the golden rain tree that if you raise them on the balloon vine, they perform poorly. This has been the evolved trade-off. It is important to remember that this has taken place within the last 50 years the golden rain tree has been commonly planted in Florida. Enough time for the drive bug's ability to grow on the new host to approach its original ability to grow on the native host. In the absence of strong phenotypic contrast today, this reciprocal rearing experiment is the only way we can know that there was a maladapted missing link that returned the bug to its prior development rate just as quickly as selection from fruit size caused a rapid evolution of obvious differences in beak length. If given a few thousand years, host specialization and reproductive isolation can inhibit interbreeding and would drive the evolution of separate genera species in Florida. If we take into account the vast amount of time life has been evolving and will continue to evolve on this planet, it isn't hard to imagine how these divides in populations drive the evolution of organisms as distinct as chickens and dinosaurs.